I grew up in Sterling Heights, Michigan. It's a suburb of Metro Detroit. And uh, I grew up in a pretty decent neighborhood. I had good parents. Uh, both my mom and my dad were both school teachers. One of the biggest struggles that I had throughout my entire life is with alcohol. And um, I never woke up craving a drink, you know, so I never really thought I was an alcoholic. But um, my struggles with alcohol cost me everything. It cost me my job several times. Uh, it cost me friendships. It cost me relationships with people that I loved, girlfriends. Um, it, it cost me a lot of problems with my family. It cost me a lot of money. That's for darn sure. Um, you know, it cost me my freedom. It cost me you know, everything. You know, and and I never, um, I never really learned from my mistakes because I never wanted to admit defeat that I was powerless over anything. Um, and it goes way back. It goes back from my childhood. You know, I didn't start drinking uh, until I was older. But the first time I got drunk, I was 15 years old. But it went up be, went, went way before that. Um, when I was growing up, I grew up in a neighborhood in Sterling Heights where, um, you know, even though it was a, pr a predominantly white neighborhood, I was still a, a very much a minority. I was an American kid growing up in a neighborhood that had mostly foreign uh, kids. A lot of kids came from uh, Yugoslavia, you know, former Yugoslavia, Macedonia or uh, Croatia or Serbia, Albania, uh, Croatia, um, the Middle East like Iraq. There were a lot of Chaldean kids in my neighborhood, a lot of Albanian kids, a lot of Italian kids. And my dad was Italian. He was full Italian, but he was born here, so he didn't really speak the language, and I never spoke the language. So most of the kids that I grew up with spoke some sort of native tongue that wasn't English. And I always wanted to fit in. I wanted to be liked. My, uh, my, uh, after school, my, my dad was an accounting teacher, so he was correcting papers until 5, 6, 7 o'clock at night sometimes. Very busy after work. And so we didn't get a whole lot of time during the school year to, uh, you know, to really hang out. My mom, uh, she taught uh, visually impaired students at the high school level, blind kids. So she didn't have to correct a lot of papers, but after work she'd be involved in her pottery class and she worked with making ceramic dolls and that was what she really liked. She was a very artistic type person. And so I found comfort in, in friendship and my acceptance was with the neighborhood kids. And so since I wasn't one of them, I always wanted to fit in and I wanted to feel liked, I wanted to feel important. So. When we were eight or nine years old and some of the kids down the street were stealing a matchbox cars from the, the store at the corner, I wanted to be the best thief so they would like me and I would steal. Uh, when I was a teenager and the kids would start fighting, uh, the, the Albanians would fight the, the Yugoslavian kids, you know, I hung around the Yugos, so I wanted to be the first one to throw the first punch because I wanted to fit in. I wanted them to like me and say, man, Zago's crazy, man, he's cool, we, he's one of us. I always wanted to feel acceptance. I never felt fully good enough. Uh, I remember I used to ride my bike around the block and three quarters around the block there was a kid that would whenever I'd pass his house he'd run out of his garage and push me off my bike and said I can't go on his side of the street and so uh, one time I built up enough courage to ride my bike past his house and he caught up to me at the end of the corner and he spit on me and he said you're ugly and so I never felt like I was good looking you know I always felt insecure about a lot of things in my life and to overcompensate so I could feel secure, I wanted my friends in the neighborhood to like me. I wanted to feel accepted. And as teenagers, then the kids start playing, messing around with drugs or alcohol. And during the time that I grew up, everyone was against marijuana. Everyone said, oh, you're a pothead, you're a high, you're a stoner. They kind of looked down on those people. But nobody had any issue with alcohol. You know, people would go in their dad's liquor cabinet and steal some, some beer and, you know, take it to school. And it was cool to drink. So that's, that's how I started there. Well, I started getting in a lot of trouble. I started getting arrested a lot. I was in and out of the Macomb County Youth Home, which is Juvenile Detention Center here in, in Michigan. And uh, I was in there countless times. I can't even remember how many times I was in there and I was on juvenile probation. When my mom left teaching, she worked, went to work for the State Board of Education. So I saw her less, but she had a higher position. She, um, and she made less money, believe it or not, but she, she was very passionate about what she did. She loved teaching people. She loved helping people. And she wanted to help school districts teach blind kids better because that's what she was passionate about. She figured she could she could make a difference and I never got that when I was a kid why she would take a pay cut and see us all less you know to take a job that would pay less and, and you know I never got it but it was because she wanted to help people and I love that about my mom but I never really got it when I was a teenager. Anyway um, so I I, I, uh, I was a delinquent. I was I, I dropped out of school. I have a ninth grade education uh, I wound up getting in more trouble and I wound up getting shipped off to a residential boarding school out in Massachusetts as a last resort to save me from being locked up for a couple years. And uh, you'd figure you'd learn your lesson. I, I learned a lot while I was there. It probably saved my life. Um, 
but I got out and I was still stealing. I was still doing a lot of dumb shit. And uh, at that point, I started drinking, and and I, I made new friends um, coming when I first came back to Michigan. And most of those friends were, were people that would go out to the bar, and I wanted to be the bar star. So I would go out every night, and I'd make lots of friends. I'd be the crazy, wacky one that would just be off the wall, obnoxious. You know, I met lots of girls, and you know, it made me feel good about myself. And um, that's how that's what defined me. You know, I was defined by my status next to my peers. It was a comparative base identity instead of, you know, me being true to myself. And uh, I didn't know myself, and I didn't like myself. But I liked the way I felt when I drank. It gave me a, a false sense of confidence. You know, I, I, I got laid by people I probably would have, though they are way out of my league. Um, I, I, I got, had a lot of fun, man, and I loved it. I loved, it, it, it was like going into the phone booth and changing into the Superman cape and, and being a different person that had all these extra superpowers. And that's what it did for me, so naturally, Somebody who didn't like himself, who felt the need for acceptance and wanted to be fitting in and liked and wanting to stand out as being uh, somebody that people admired, um, that's what I went to. And I went to it on a regular basis. And over the years, I got in a lot of trouble. Uh, I made some mistakes that, that cost me jobs. I, I remember yelling at bosses. I mean, bosses that loved me, man, that really stuck their neck out for me and really did everything to help me. You know, I remember, screw you, John. You know, I mean, I would talk to him and say, he was my boss. At talk. He was one of my first mentors. And I talked to him like he was like a piece of shit. And uh, naturally, he finally fired me. And, uh, you know, and, and I didn't learn my lesson. And um, he wouldn't take me back. And I needed to have that lesson because I had, I was at 21 or 22 years old, I was making fifty or $60,000 a year with a ninth grade education. At that time, it was amazing. And uh, so I lost it all. And... Um, couldn't pay for my apartments, couldn't pay my car payments, so my dad had to bail me out of that one. And uh, unfortunately, by people bailing me out, it was really the worst thing that ever happened to me because it never taught me how to be truly accountable. Um, it wasn't until later when I really started feeling the pain because my dad wasn't going to buy my tires or cover my car insurance anymore when I was in my 30s. And the, the love of my life left me because she, you know, we were, we were engaged. I was engaged to a girl in, in uh, 2006. We started dating in 2000. And uh, we got engaged, and she got pregnant, and she aborted our child. And I tried like hell to talk her out of that. And it was 666, June 6, 2006. She aborted our child, and I could never understand why. And I couldn't look at her the same after that. So we only stayed together for another month, and, and we finally broke up. She moved back to Chicago, and, and I stayed here in Michigan. And uh, not even a few months later, she uh, started dating another guy. And uh, from my understanding, she, the, the man was married. And he got her pregnant, and she kept that baby. And it made me feel so shitty about myself. And it really made me feel, you know, like I just wasn't a man. You know, I wasn't somebody that she could count on. You know, I mean, I was getting drunk a lot. I was stealing. I was still doing a bunch of asshole things. I was, you know, violent. I mean, I, I was just, I was, I was unruly. And... Um, so no wonder she couldn't feel stable enough to or secure to want to have a child with me because she'd probably be on her own. I'd be in prison or something. And that made me really wake up temporarily. Uh, but I would still continue to drink. And a couple years after that, I got my first DUI, and then I lost my job because of it. I lost uh, my house, and uh, I wound up moving out to Arizona, flat broke, to start another career. And I started doing really well, making close to $100,000 a year, uh, not even working the full year, only working eight months a year. And uh, so I was on easy street again. Things were going great. And my old boss, Jerry, said, why do you hate yourself so much, Joey? I said, what the fuck are you talking about? I love myself. Look, I got a Cadillac. I'm making great money. I've got a house in Michigan now that I can go back to. And I've got a nice house that I'm renting in Arizona. I got, I got life by the balls. And it wasn't even a couple weeks after that. He knew, right? He saw right through me how hurt, how hurt I was and how weak I was and how much I didn't like myself, even though I didn't see it myself. And I got a second DUI, which cost me my license. I got revoked. I then lost my job in Arizona, which then cost me my house that I had in Michigan and the house that I was renting in Arizona. I lost my freedom for a period of time. Um, my license was gone for seven years, and I was flat broke. Flat broke. And I think that over the years, if I look at all the big things that I lost, whether it was a job or you know a career, you know a good income, um, whether it was a relationship, whether it was my, would have been my child, um, my future wife, um, my house, my freedom, my, my car, my credit, every single thing that I lost 
that was of substance, somewhere in that equation, alcohol was one of the variables of that equation. But I never wanted to believe that alcohol was something that, that it was me, it was my recklessness, it was my decision making, it was my whatever it was, but it was never alcohol. I always had an excuse to protect the alcohol. And it was never the alcohol, it was me that chose to drink the alcohol, but the alcohol was always a factor that caused me to lose something that I didn't want to lose, hurt somebody I didn't want to hurt, somehow lose. And I got tired of being a loser. And I started going to AA when it was court mandated or when I was told, hey, you're going to, you know, and, and I, I would go through the talk, but I never really walked the walk. I never made relationships in my programs of recovery. I still wanted to have the same friends. And uh, as a result, for 18 years or so, I was in and out of AA and, and other recovery programs. And uh, I never really, really got the message because I really didn't surrender to it. I never would admit that I would never admit complete defeat because an A-type personality, someone who likes to control things, wants to be the boss, never wants to admit failure or weakness. And uh, the minute I did, the stronger I got. Because when I'm down and out, if I get arrested and I'm in a jail cell, it's really easy for me to surrender and get on my knees and say, God, I know I haven't talked to you in seven years since the last time I got in trouble, but I swear to, I swear to you, if you get me out of this, I'll never, ever, ever do it again. I promise I'll be better. I promise I'll go to church. I promise I'll be a better person, blah, 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 blah. And then he gives me another chance. I start doing the stuff that I promised. But when life starts getting good again, my ego takes over. I get confident again. I get cocky. And I take that will back. And I want to steer the ship again. And when I steer the ship, it's just a matter of time I'm going to crash. There are certain things that I can control in this life, but I've got to know the difference. I've got to know there are things that I can't control. And I've got to know the things that are stronger than me. And I can't get in the ring with alcohol and win long term. It's like going to the casino. Eventually, you're going to lose. I mean, you can win. You can be great at this. And you can have some really good lucky streaks. But eventually, everybody loses. That's why casinos stay in business. And I don't want to lose anymore. I don't want to be a loser. So I have to admit my complete defeat in that area of my life. Um, like I said, I would go to AA meetings. I remember comparing myself to the people who said, Oh, I had to wake up and I had, I'd polish off a bottle by noon and go you know, to the liquor store and get, that was never me. So I would compare myself to them and say, I was never really alcoholic. They were the alcoholics. I was never that bad. And by comparing myself to those people, it would enable me to go back out there and do the same shit I was doing before and eventually get the same result, if not worse. So for me, the best thing to do is just not drink. If I take that out of the equation, I will never get another DUI again. I won't lose a job because of alcohol. I won't screw up. I won't be mentally in, you know, insane because my chemicals in my brain are still adjusting from a hangover. So me having that realization created a clearing, a pathway that allowed me to change a lot of other things in my life. So and it, it's a real struggle though sometimes because I want to feel good and alcohol is a real good escape for me to avoid feeling bad and feeling ashamed or discouraged. And it wasn't until I actually committed to this program and started working my fourth and fifth step that I really noticed a difference and felt free of those self-defeating feelings. So if you struggle or know anybody who does struggle with that, you feel free to share this. I know that a lot of people like to stay kind of anonymous with this sort of thing, but I, I like to share it because I think it could definitely help other people. So that's why I'm saying what I'm saying to you. And, um, you know, that's just part of my story. Have a good day. If you want to know more, you can always subscribe to my channel. And I'll share everything, good, bad, or ugly. Um, I try to be an open book um, because people that shared with me helped me get to where I'm at today. And I feel it's my obligation and duty to help the next person. Have a great day. It's Joey Zago.